Welcome back to another Monday on the Damage Report. I guess you could call it a, a, a Ray-tastic Monday <laughs> on the Damage Report. We've got lots of stories we got to get to today. We're going to talk about the uh, ever-increasing circus that is the speakership race and the absolute disarray that I'm reveling in that the Republicans are experiencing in the House. We're going to give you updates from occupied Palestine um, and just the tragedies we're seeing come out of there. And we're also going to talk about the increase in Islamophobia that we've seen throughout the Western world and in Western media. And joining me to discuss all that and more is Senator Nina Turner, who since the last time I saw you has launched We Are Somebody. Congratulations on that. Thanks, Ray. I'm glad to be here with you on this Raytastic <laughs> Monday. And yes, We Are Somebody. People can go to wearesomebody.org to get involved. And it is an organization to help uh, working class people in this country. Awesome. Everybody, make sure to go check that out. Um, and with that, Senator Turner, are you ready to get into this first story? Ready to go, Ray. <laughs> All right. As I mentioned, Republicans are in disarray. Uh, let's take a look. House Republicans have just elected a speaker nominee who in 16 years in this Congress hasn't passed a single bill because his focus has not been on the American people. His focus has been on peddling lies and conspiracy theories and driving division amongst the American people. That was Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries speaking on the Republican candidate for Speaker uh, Jim Jordan, who is facing an uphill climb to the <laughs> to the speakership position, with at least ten to twenty Republican members who oppose his nomination. Quick reminder: it only takes four four House Republicans to prevent him from becoming Speaker. He's got to reckon with 10 to 20 who don't want to see him take up that position. So a little bit more from CBS News. While Jordan's confidants remain optimistic that he can get to the necessary 217 votes Tuesday when the House is scheduled to bring a vote to the floor, several who are more critical of Jordan privately insisted this weekend that at about, uh, that at about a dozen Republicans remain unwilling to support him due to their frustrations over how Representative Steve Scalise, Republican of Louisiana, was treated during his speaker bid and their simmering anger over the ouster of former Speaker Kevin McCarthy. And just to get into a little little bit more of their frustrations. Now, one representative's opposition to Jordan was quoted saying, I may no on allowing Matt Gates and the other seven to win by putting their individual in as speaker, said Representative John Rutherford. So as I said previously, he can only afford to lose four votes from the Republicans in order to become speaker. Um, and as Representative Rutherford mentioned, it Matt Gates and seven others uh, led the ousting of uh, Representative former Speaker Kevin McCarthy. So just to contextualize that, the rest of the Republican caucus voted to keep Kevin McCarthy. Those eight Republicans and every Democrat voted to oust him. But so there was a pretty large consensus within the Republican Party on Kevin McCarthy, which is why we are seeing this massive pushback against individuals like Steve Scalise, as well as uh, Jim Jordan. Now, Jordan is apparently not going down without a fight, although I think that he absolutely will end up going down. Um, but his supporters are uh, attempting to act on his behalf in, I don't know how else to frame this, but goofy ways. From the New York Times, several of Mr. Jordan's supporters have posted the phone numbers of mainstream GOP lawmakers they count as holdouts, encouraging followers to flood the Capitol switchboard with calls demanding they back Mr. Jordan or face the wrath of conservative voters as they gear up for primary season. The wrath of conservative voters is something I strongly feel they probably will already have to contend with in the upcoming uh, re-elections. Not so much in the primaries, but definitely in their reelection campaigns. Um, but some Jordan supporters, even Dan Crenshaw, see this tactic as the mistake that it is. He said that a high pressure campaign is a really dumb way to try to get more support for Jordan, which this is obvious for anyone who knows how you play politics. Jordan should be courting these votes, 
offering concessions to the holdouts, not having large swaths of constituents harass them in their offices, <laughs> not exactly the most effective way to swing votes for something that isn't a policy issue, but a political issue. But so the GOP is preparing, and this is so funny, and I'm, I am, as I mentioned, reveling in this. They are preparing the backup for the backup for their backup. <laughs> Because if Jordan is unable to secure enough support by Tuesday's vote, some key Jordan skeptics and veteran Republicans are now preparing to push for a bipartisan deal that would expand the ability of Representative Patrick McHenry, Republican of North Carolina, to move legislation on Israel and government funding through his current ministerial role as Speaker pro tempore, which I have strong reservations about. I think that we should all be wary that Republicans who love to fall back on procedure, procedure, procedure are so willing to upend procedure to ordain this person who hasn't gone through the rigorous process of being elected speaker of the house to ascend to a level of power he should not hold. But I, you know, that aside, there is an issue here. Uh, Senator Turner, the Republicans are in complete disarray. They're running around like chickens with their heads cut off. Um, and it's to the detriment of passing a lot of things, but on the politics side of the spectrum, this is really good for the Democrats and really bad for the Republicans as we're facing, uh, you know, this upcoming election. Yeah, I'm not so sure, Ray, that their constituents are going to punish them. I mean, they should. They are embarrassing the Democratic, I mean, excuse me, they are embarrassing the Republican party. This is the clown car and my apologies to clowns because I think clowns are a lot higher than what we're seeing happening in the Republican House of Representatives right now. So apologies to all professional clowns, you are much higher than them. And this reminds me of the movie Dumb and Dumber. I mean, that's the only way that I can describe this and especially your point about how a Congressman Jim Jordan from the great state of Ohio, which I'm so ashamed to say that he is from Ohio, but he is, uh, should in fact be courting uh, the people he need. He needs to vote for him instead of trying to uh, weigh them down. Yeah, this is dumb and dumber. So it's a it's a horrible tactic. This is embarrassing for the entire Congress, but I would say especially for the Republicans. This is their problem, and their problem. I, well, you know what, Ray? We can't say it's their problem alone because it's not their problem alone. Mm -hmm. It becomes the American people's problem. Now, in terms of the ability to pass legislation. I'm not so sure. I mean, up until this crisis that we're in, you know, most of what the Republicans were trying to pass was not very helpful to the American people to begin with. However, there's a however there. I know there are other important matters that we have to take care of and to have the entire world see that our Congress is in disarray in this way is ultimately embarrassing. For us all. I mean, as much as I, you know, I am not a Republican, obviously, but I still want to see our bodies be able to at least, at least function, at least be able to have some debate that is of merit to the American people instead of this damn soap opera we're seeing play out before our eyes while Big Mama and Big Papa's all over this country and their children and their children, children are suffering. The people's work, and I put that in air quotes, right? Because it depends on what they're working on, mm -hmm. is not being done. Absolutely. And the Republicans are going to have to contend soon with the fact that the continuing resolution is going to expire. They're going That's to have right. to pass a budget and they're going to have, I, I, I keep mentioning this, but Matt Gates says that there's 10,000 workers in his district alone that are going to be out of work or be asked to come into work without pay. And that's going to be a, a huge issue for, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats. Although we've yes. seen polling that primarily the blame is falling on the Republicans, but generally people are blaming Congress as a whole. So they're going to have to get their, their butts kicked into gear to figure this out. And, and speaking how this might end up harming the Democrats. They are potentially working right now to uh, give the Republicans a lifeline. Let's take a look at this video. House Republicans can continue to triple down on the chaos, the dysfunction, and the extremism that has been visited upon the American people as a result of the House Republican Civil War. On the other hand, traditional Republicans can break away from the extremism, partner with Democrats, 
on an enlightened bipartisan path forward so we can end the recklessness and get back to doing the business of the American people. House of Representatives has been without a speaker for 13 days now. And during that time, they are unable to vote on legislation. So that was House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries speaking to NBC and saying that he's anticipating discussions uh, this week when lawmakers have now returned to Washington. Speaking to Politico, he said this, there are informal conversations that have been underway when we get back to Washington tomorrow, which is today. It's important to begin to formalize those discussions. So there's a lot of speculation as to what this means. Is Hakeem Jeffries angling to become the Speaker of the House himself? A couple weeks ago, I would have called you crazy for even suggesting it, though, as every day passes, I think the prospect becomes slightly more likely. I would still be shocked if that came to pass. But this week, more likely than it was last week. Um, but the more likely speculation that people are making is that he's going to work with Republicans to install a uh, Republican as the Speaker of the House. So a little bit about what a perspective deal might look like. When asked what House Democrats might be asking for a deal with House Republicans, Jeffrey said his caucus wants Quote, to ensure that votes are taken on bills that have substantial Democratic support and substantial Republican support so that the extremists aren't able to dictate the agenda. Ah, Hakeem Jeffries never missing an opportunity to punch to the left of his party. Now a little bit more of what he had to say. The current rules of the House have facilitated a handful of Republicans being able to determine what gets voted on in the House of Representatives, and that undermines the interests of the American people. We can change the rules to facilitate bipartisanship, and that should be the starting point of our conversation. So I will say this. Hakeem Jeffries is no ally to the progressives. In fact, he's an enemy of progressive values and progressive policies and progressive legislation. I do not want to see him become the Speaker of the House. And I fear for any Republican that he's going to whip votes for the Democrats in order to vote for to install as Speaker of the House. On a separate note, the Democrat the Democratic Party is so stupid. They're so stupid because every every time they do this, it's it's Charlie Brown and the Republicans are Lucy in the football. They'll make promises to you to get your votes in during this period of time because they need your votes. And as soon as the time comes for them to carry out those promises, they're gonna pull that football away from the Democrats. They are not going to follow through on their promises. They are not going to deliver. So don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. They're, you know, the the Republicans in swing districts are gonna take some massive hits right now. Let them take those hits. Don't make things easier for them. And definitely don't get fooled by a Republican Party. And it is, again, as I said, Senator Turner, just disappointing to see someone like Hakeem Jeffries as the, the leader of the uh, minority caucus in the House, just someone who even in that moment is saying we need to prevent extremism from within his own party. It's It's absurd. This man is no ally to progressives. No, not at all. I sighed deeply. I mean, he is in the image of the person who came before him and the person before that and the person before that. So my expectation that he would be different than them, it just was not there. And I think for most progressives that remains, you know, good luck with that. Now for the, the extremists on the Republican side, good luck with that. I mean, they got a certain set of rules passed for their particular side of the aisle in terms of uh, a, a minority of folks in within the Republican House caucus to be able to run the show, and they are running the show. We might not like how they're running the show, but they are running the show, and they are making demands, and they are they have no fear in the demands that they are making. Right? I I wish that we had some riders and riders like that on the Democratic side. Mm -hmm. Hello, somebody. I mean, I really, really do. Riders for what is right, just and good. What we got in the Republican caucus is riders.
fighters for just chaos and foolishness and mayhem. That's what we see happening. But imagine if we had just a few, especially in that progressive caucus, who is ready to rock power like that. Okay, we'd be a lot better off. As far as them not being able to get anything done, I question what they were getting done in the first place for the American people. If this had been any other job, Ray, I mean, I can't wait to hear our commenters. Had it been any other place of employment, these these people would be fired. Try not to call them clowns because, again, I don't mm-hmm. want to disrespect the clowns. I like clowns, actually. But they would be fired because they can't even do, they got one job and they can't even do that job. You can't even pass a budget. We got continuing resolutions. We back in the mess again and would have been there again, even if McCarthy was still at the helm. So my question becomes, all, of, all to, to what end are we uh, propping up or helping to preserve. What are we preserving? What types of bills will pass? Will it be the types of bills that give relief to the American people? And will it be not? Most likely it's not going to be anything that's going to give real relief to the American people. So while I do recognize, let me bring it back. I do recognize that that body needs to function. And in order to, to just function, right? We ain't even talking about spat passing anything spectacular. Mm-hmm. We're just talking about functioning. In order to function, they need a speaker of the house. I get that. So that's a given. But much beyond that, I have no faith in the Republicans or the Democrats when it comes to delivering material conditions or, or policies that change material conditions for the people that we care about in this country. Mm-hmm. I, that's an excellent point, especially given that Hakeem Jeffries, when he's holding, uh, he has the ability to to spin things really positively for the Democratic Party because the Republicans are doing everything they can to. I believe it was uh, even Senator Lindsey Graham who described it as them shooting themselves in the foot. So he's got an opportunity to uh, do some really good politicking, and instead he goes on TV and says. We need to pass what we can bipartisanly uh, instead of attacking the Republicans for being a disaster right now. And what does that mean? It means that nothing, like you said, that is actually going to benefit the American people is going to pass because he's, as I said, punching the left of his party, you know, and he's explicitly said he doesn't support things like Medicare for all. No, doesn't. (laughs) And Ray, I'm just one, just one more point. I'm glad you brought up bipartisanship. American people, bipartisanship doesn't always mean good. Mm-hmm. Okay, I just gotta put that out there. So when each party talking about what they've done bipartisanly, we gotta read the fine print. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that it's never good, but what I want our viewers to understand that just because you have a politician uh, mouthing off about bipartisanship does not always means that substance of what was passed was good. <laughs> Especially when it's the uh, the corporate interests that have captured both the Republicans and the Democrats that brings them is. together to pass things that benefit corporations generally to the detriment of the American people. Thank you for saying that because I'm sick and tired of bipartisanship being portrayed as as the epitome of of positive positivity in the House in the Senate. It is absolutely almost always not the case. All right, well, thank you all for your comments. We're going to get to some more of those in a little bit. But before we do, I'm going to get this. I'm in a good mood right now, but you know, this next story is is been really difficult to cover. I know a lot of you were watching the main show. I had a a very emotional moment talking about the situation, and um, I'll try to keep it together for this story, but things are grim in occupied Palestine. We're going to give you a little bit of an update on the war between Israel and Hamas. So more than 2,600 people have died as Israel has pounded Gaza with strikes, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry. Again, 2,600 people have been murdered in these air strikes, and that number continues to grow. As of right now, a child is murdered in Gaza every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes, a child is murdered in these airstrikes. Now, Israeli forces said on Saturday that the past week of crippling airstrikes in Gaza could soon be followed by significant ground operations. And just to give some context to that, this weekend, Israeli forces shot a Israeli settler because they believed he was a member of Hamas. So if you're wondering how are these ground forces going to tell the difference between Hamas fighters and Palestinian uh, civilians, they won't. 
they couldn't even tell the difference between a Hamas fighter and an Israeli citizen. So if that sounds scary to you, it's because it should sound scary to you. Now, as I'm sure you're all aware of by now, there was also an evacuation order given to the residents of Gaza. According to Israel, half a million residents have left northern Gaza to head south. CNN reported that the IDF said Saturday it would allow people to move south for their own safety. They didn't exactly allow them to do that. We'll get into that in a bit. On specified streets of Gaza during a six hour window, but it was unclear how widely the messaging was received on the ground given the widespread electricity and internet blackout or how safe passage would be. So there are only two places in Gaza that people can evacuate. The Rafah border crossing, which we have a picture we can where we can highlight that for you, which connects Gaza and Egypt and is the only passage not controlled by Israel and Rafah crossing, which is the southernmost part of uh, exit from Gaza and borders Egypt's Sinai Desert. Now, there are issues with this though, mainly that roads have been bombed. The border had previously been closed. So a little more from the Washington Post. The main road running north to south were crowded for a second day Saturday after the Israeli military announced a six hour window for civilians to move along designated streets to parts of Gaza south of the Wadi Gaza wetlands here. In some areas, traffic came to a standstill with trucks, buses, overpacked cars, and people on foot all crowding onto the same narrow roads to head south. As I mentioned earlier, it wasn't exactly true when the IDF said that they would allow safe passage of these Palestinian people because the roads and the travelers have been hit by airstrikes while trying to follow the evacuation order. Reports emerged Friday of a a strike on cars packed with fleeing civilians. The Washington Post verified a graphic video of the aftermath recorded along Salah al-Din Road. Palestinian Health Ministry said 40 people were injured in the attack, uh, were taken to Al-Shifa Hospital. The IDF are, quote, not aware of such an event at this location. We did not fire. We will not cooperate with the manipulations of Hamas and Israeli military said in a statement. Of course, they denied it because what they would be admitting to if they didn't deny it is a blatant war crime. The Washington Post also reported that U.S. officials said they negotiated a temporary opening at the Rafah border crossing between Gaza and Egypt for American citizens seeking to flee. But a Palestinian border authority spokesman uh, and witnesses in the area said the crossing remains closed. So we'll get a little bit more in a to a little bit more in a minute on the evacuation of United States citizens in. Gaza, although I I would say I have serious reservations about the uh, care that the United States is going to execute and and bringing these individuals home when they didn't care at all when an American citizen, Shireen Abu Akleh, was murdered while reporting on the ground uh, by the IDF. No, No condemnation there, not a single tear shed by the members of the United States government. It's just absurd, but um. Uh, Senator Turner, the language around what's going on here has been so hard to listen to because what we are seeing, in my opinion, is a genocide of the Palestinian people, an attempt at ethnic cleansing, mass displacement, almost uh, a like one eighth of the population of Gaza has now been completely displaced. They have no home to return to if they're ever even allowed to return to the northern part of Gaza. And we're seeing politicians, we're seeing spokespeople for Joe Biden saying that people asking for a ceasefire are repugnant and disgraceful. It is horror. And we just saw that that the uh, the Secretary of the Treasury said there's enough money for two wars. This is disturbing, knowing the absolute devastation that's happening on the ground, the number of civilians on both sides that have been brutally murdered and the disproportionate power that the Israeli government holds to end this. We're not imploring them to, uh, you know, reach peace to, you know, have a ceasefire. We are beating the drums of war and the civilians are being hit the hardest. Yeah, right. I sigh deeply. Um, troops are being sent, about 2,000. I just read uh, 2,000 American troops are going to be sent. Uh, this is a moment that humanity is on the line here. That's what this. And so, if anybody, if you're wondering what side to choose, 
we should be choosing the side of humanity. The UN has come out, other groups have come out and, and said that this, these are crimes against humanity. It's going against the rules of war. And I put that in air quotes too, because it's really asinine to think that there truly are any rules of war, but there is supposed to be some, uh, some, some dictates when it comes to this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And what is happening to the Palestinian people in the Gaza defies all the, the, the rules of war at this time. You know, I was reading something that Dr. Robert Reich had put out and it really hit me, uh, Ray, that I want to share with us. And he said, hate is corrosive. It consumes and devours those who practice it. History shows that where hate is normalized, its poison seeps into the subsoil of a culture. It gruesomely distorts societies. Brutality, fear, and distrust transform, transfer, um, transform otherwise rational human beings into closed-minded fanatics. People no longer listen to the other side. They view them as threats and enemies. On and on. No, I can go on and on and on. This situation, we definitely need a ceasefire. That's mm -hmm. it. I mean, you got to have a ceasefire. Doctors are saying, nurses are saying, you know, medical personnel, humanitarian um, volunteers are saying that this is untenable and they can't even get help into the Gaza. Over 50% or at least 50% of the Palestinians in that region are under the age of 15. Mm -hmm. So riddle me this. They had nothing to do. With Hamas being elected, a terrorist group, they, they have nothing to do with that. Right. Every time I see the pictures of them babies, either babies, either Israeli babies or Palestinian babies, I'm outraged by the whole thing. And so the only way to try to get back to some spaces is to have a cease fire and the United States role in this is never going to be forgotten. And we are going to look back on this. I mean, this is almost one of the worst things I've seen in my lifetime. I've certainly studied a lot, you know, talked to my 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 parents and and you know grandparents when they were still alive, and other elders who have lived through some pretty tragic and deep times. But living through this kind of moment, it is disturbing in every single way, and retribution against Hamas cannot be. To just take and kill or starve out mm -hmm. innocent Palestinians. And then the statement being made that the Palestinians should uprise against Hamas, that it somehow is their fault and they're being called animals. And you know, right, we ain't got, we, this ain't, we're not doing a whole show on this, but it's very reminiscent of some other things mm -hmm. that have happened throughout human history. I will tell you that. And so no one should be okay with what is happening. And if you want to know what side you should be on, you should be on the side of humanity, period. And the United States, ooh we. And we should be the moral voice here. We should be pushing for humanity here, but that's not happening. And I've, I've, I've been really happy to see all the protests for peace all across the United States, all across Europe. And, and it's gotten very little coverage here. But in Israel, yeah, in Israel, the people are protesting against yeah. ben Benjamin Netanyahu, the far oh, yeah. right wing government in Israel, demanding peace. The families of people who have That's been it. taking hostage, people whose children, people whose parents have been taken hostage are going on Israeli news and saying yeah. that my parents don't want this. My children wouldn't right. have wanted this. We need peace now, That's not right. to mention that they're indiscriminately bombing Gaza. How many hostages are going to be killed because there's no precision yeah. in what they're doing? Go and after Hamas, but don't do it to, and, and I forget, uh, Ray, I forget what, Kyle, I think it was Crystal and Kyle. I was listening to them. And a the point that, that Kyle made was that special ops. Mm -hmm. th this, this is a, this is a job for special ops so that you have very little collateral damage. And then the argument that Hamas is using Palestinians for shields. Now, they, they, they haven't proven that. That's number one. But number two, let's, let's go with the argument that they are. So does that then justify going in and doing this? If Hamas is doing wrong, you know, my grandmother used to say two wrongs don't make a right. You know what I mean? So even if that was the case, there is no justification for just indiscriminately going into the Gaza and just killing innocent 
people were over 50%. And you know what, right for me, I don't care if they grown or they children, but we just mm-hmm. put an especially on that when over 50% of that population is under the age of 15. And it's not going to have a good end. You know, Marianne Williamson, who's running for president, and I appreciated much of what she had to say, but she said, you know, eye for eye don't work. Everybody's going to be blind. When this is all said and done. So, right, you're right. There are a lot of Israelis who are standing up saying, we don't want this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's really brave of them to do that when their, you know, yeah. right wing government is going after people. They've gone after yes. uh, people who were survivors of the attack on Kibbutz Berry, uh and, and yeah. tried to silence them. So, you know, I commend them. I commend all the bravery of the people here in the United States, particularly mm-hmm. our Muslim community. And uh, I do want to mention that you said, Senator Turner, this reminds you of a time in our history. And unfortunately, this next story is really, really reminiscent of a horrible time in our history that I wish I wish it didn't remind me so much of, but it really does. And I want to give a quick content advisory. We're not going to show any graphic images, but we are going to be describing the murder of a child. Mm. Now, many people have likened the Hamas attacks uh, to being Israel's 9-11. And regardless of how well you think that metaf- metaphor it, it fits, it definitely conjures up strong emotions in the United States. And as everyone will remember, the rampant Islamophobia that took a stranglehold on the United States after 9-11, we are seeing a resurgence of that right now because a Chicago area landlord was arrested and charged with murder and hate crimes after authorities said he stabbed and killed a six-year-old Palestinian American boy and seriously wounded his mother, allegedly because they were Muslim. CNN reported that Joseph M. Zuba, who's 71, was charged with first degree murder, attempted first degree murder, two counts of a hate crime and aggravated battery with a deadly weapon, the Will County, Illinois Sheriff's Office said in a news release. The United States Justice Department has also opened a federal hate crime investigation into the attack. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland announced Saturday or on Sunday, excuse me. So here we have a picture of the murderer who carried out this heinous hate crime. But more importantly, we have a picture of six-year-old Wadia Al-Fayoumi, excuse me, celebrating his sixth birthday just a few short days ago. So a little bit more details on what happened, what we know so far. And I I wanna say um, massive props to CARE, who the Center for uh, American Islamic Relations, who has been on top of this story, from the the first moment, because I'll say I live here in Chicago. The initial reporting on the story did not call it what it was. They did not call it a uh, hate crime motivated by anti-Muslim sentiment, anti-Palestinian sentiment. But CARE did immediately. They got the facts immediately and had a press conference and called it exactly what it was. And because of that, now the other news outlets here in Chicago have been forced to call it what it is. And it's gotten a lot of attention because of their excellent advocacy work. But so some more details from CNN. The family had lived on the house's ground floor for, <coughs> excuse me, two years without previous, <coughs> excuse me, previous notable issues with Zuba. But in te- text to the boy's father from the hospital after the attack, Shaheen said the landlord knocked on their door. And when she opened, he tried to choke her and proceeded to attack her with a knife, yelling, You Muslims must die. She hid in the bathroom to call 911. And by the time that she exited the bathroom, she found that he had stabbed her son 26 times and killed him. Now, as I mentioned, Merrick Garland announced on Sunday that they are opening a federal hate crime investigation into the stabbing as well. Um, Also, the mother is expected to survive. Her injuries were critical. She is still in the hospital, but she is expected to survive. Now, as heartbreaking as the story is, we're going to have to prepare ourselves because this is unlikely to be the last. Um, FBI Director Christopher Rye said that the FBI has seen an increase in reported threats in the United States amid the uh, Israel-Hamas war. The FBI official noted that over the past week, <clears throat> the agency has seen an uptick in rhetoric targeting Jewish people as well as Muslim institutions. FBI officials have 
uh, also been meeting with leaders in Jewish and Muslim communities across the United States as the threats increase. The goal of these meetings, both in person and over the phone, has been to tell leaders, if you see something that concerns you, please let us know because we want to keep you safe. And Senator Turner, I'm worried because this isn't enough. Particularly, you know, I live in a majority Muslim community. There is a lot of reasonable apprehension amongst Muslim American communities with working with the FBI, which after 9-11 illegally spied on members of the community, erroneously put many Muslim Americans on the do not fly list because they happen to have the same name as someone who committed atrocities halfway across the world. You know, they they have roped Muslim Americans into conspiracies. There is rightfully you know, fear in working with these organizations. I think what we really need to be focusing on is the spread of Islamophobic rhetoric. You know, on our mainstream media, I saw on CNN they interviewed a man, an Israeli fighter, who said we need to turn to Gaza to dust. No pushback, no pushback from the journalists. This Islamophobic rhetoric is spreading from our politicians, from our media, and we need to take the fight to where it's beginning. And we can't just try to. You know, utilize law enforcement to come in after the fact, after these heinous crimes have been committed. We need to be killing this where it starts. Yeah, I mean, we do. I, I'm just, I'm almost speechless here, Ray, because this is uh, incredibly hard and, and difficult. And, you know, I think back to 9 11. You know, my, my father is a black man, but he is Muslim. He's a practicing, you know, he practices and he has a Muslim name. And when 9-11 hit, I was always worried about him and just thinking as hard as this society is is on black men. In that moment, his only saving grace, ironically, was that he is a black man on site, you know, before they hear his name, but still worried. And and I'm worried about him right now. I know most of the Islamophobic, the, the targets are uh, Arab Americans or people of Arab descent and not necessarily people who are converts to Islam. But it is something that we all should be incredibly concerned about. What are we doing when a six year old baby in the United States of America can be stabbed 26 times because their parents, his parents, his parents are Muslim. They are practicing Muslim. What does that say? There is something terribly wrong. And it goes back to something that Dr. Robert Rice said about the creeping in of hatred is a poison that this 71 year old man thought it okay to do what he did. This stuff is going to spread. Actually, I mean, definitely to Jewish institutions, to Muslim institutions. But let's ask ourselves, what the hell are we doing? And as far as I'm concerned, the White House, the con- none of those leaders are doing enough to tamp this kind of stuff down. As a matter of fact, some of them are putting gasoline on the fire. Mm-hmm. And we all going to get burned at some point. Nobody is going to escape this, not here at home and not abroad. And that is why a ceasefire and a way to find in peace is, in fact, the only way. There is no other way. Absolutely. And, you know, no matter, you know, no matter how many Biden spokespeople, the press secretary or whoever, oh. the State Department calls us repugnant and disgraceful. I'll continue to be repugnant and disgraceful and demand for humanity. ceasefire. Yeah. Right. For, for humanity. Hard. I mean, go after Hamas, you know, so let us make it clear. Go after Hamas, get them. But to just, just kill innocent people all over the world. Mm mm. That we're gonna pay. We're gonna pay for this, right? The I only, mean, as a, as a as a as a human species, all of us are at some point are gonna pay for this. Absolutely. The only thing that's repugnant and disgraceful is the murder of innocent civilians here in the United States, in Gaza, and Israel. And Israel. That's right. That's um, right. All right. With that, we have to take our next break, but stick around because next news not not as not as sad, but definitely extremely. St- stupid from the right wing of America. Uh, We'll be right back. (laughs) The argument from the other side is that sexual orientation is immutable and unchangeable. We already talked about this yesterday. And first of all, there, there there was never any reason to believe that. Okay, this idea that 
you know, born gay or whatever. We've rolled back decades of progress in women's rights. So it only makes sense to bring back the backwards thinking that being gay is a choice or a mistake that needs to be fixed. Just quickly before I get into the rest of that story, my question for you, Matt Walsh, is do you choose to be straight every day? Do you wake up and you have to choose not to be gay? I don't think that's something you would want to admit to, but maybe ruminate on that idea for a while and realize that you are a complete and utter imbecile who is not capable of, of any type of critical thinking whatsoever. Now, Matt Walsh made these comments in his argument defending conversion therapy, which should you know always be referred to as conversion torture. Because therapy is a word that's meant to make it seem nicer than what it is. It is torture. He's saying that anyone tortured by being gay and wants to be straight should have the freedom to seek that help. Being gay is the torture, not the torture that they put people through at these conversion torture sites. Now, we'll talk about how conversion torture doesn't work. But first, here is his ridiculous argument. A person's sexual preferences and tastes can absolutely be affected by all manner of things, trauma, abuse, um, exposure to pornography from a young age. Many things can impact a person's sexual preferences. I mean, this is not really disputed by any serious person. Um, there is no gay gene, no matter how hard they look for one. And the idea that people are born gay has always been incoherent because, you know, if people are born gay, like born gay, you're gay from birth, right? That's what that would mean. And then that means that there are what? Uh, homosexual infants out there? Again, no sane person thinks that. So there's no reason why a person can't seek and receive successful counseling to overcome same-sex attraction. The lack of gay babies implies straight babies, which is disconcerting coming from someone who said things like this in Matt Walsh's own words. So to all of a sudden act like this phenomenon of girls getting pregnant at that at a young age that we consider young, 16 or 17, to act like it's a new thing is ridiculous. It's always been like that way. Girls between the ages of like 17 and 24 is when they're technically most fertile. Aside from the fact that that's not true, it is extremely creepy coming from Matt Walsh, who has made his entire brand, his obsession with the genitalia of children. But again, the concept of there being a gay baby is silly because the concept of there being a straight baby is silly. Don't force adult sexual ideas onto infants who have no concept of sexuality. When your little, uh, when your daughter becomes friends with a boy in kindergarten, don't call her uh, his girlfriend. Don't call him her boyfriend. That's just as creepy. The idea that this is limited to to gay people is just plain and simple homophobia. Now, let's start with the simpler fact at hand before a crash course for Matt Walsh on sexuality, conversion therapy, conversion torture. It does not work. Now, there are many meta analysis on the various studies, but here's the findings from a Coventry University study that was published online by the UK government. Main findings from that, there is no robust evidence that conversion therapy can uh, achieve its stated therapeutic aim of changing sexual orientation or gender identity. The types of practices tend to be similar for conversion therapy for sexual orientation and for gender identity. For example, talking therapies delivered by faith groups or mental health professionals. Conversion therapies were associated with self-reported harms among research participants who had experienced conversion therapy for sexual orientation and for gender identity. For example, negative health effects like depression and feeling suicidal. There is uh, indicative evidence from the surveys that transgender respondents were as likely or more likely to be offered and receive conversion therapy than non-transgender, lesbian, gay, or bisexual respondents. And acts of physical, psychological, and sexual abuse, electrocution, and forced medication, isolation, and confinement, verbal abuse, and humiliation are all examples of the barbaric practice. And it's by no means eradicated from the United States. Here's a map that shows how many states still allow uh, conversion therapy. Now, I'll just bring you in here, Senator Turner, because this is these people are the thought leaders 
for the right wing. These people who project their ignorance as a source of pride, who wear their hate as a badge of honor. That is the first thing that comes out of their mouth in all of their, their videos. These are the thought leaders for the, the conservative movement in this country. He is sitting there smugly advocating for torturing gay people out of being gay. And we've seen the rollbacks and protections for, you know, many minority groups, including the LGBTQ community in this country, based on someone who has no expertise, not just on, you know, gay people in any subject, no subject. Matt Walsh is cited to by state legislators as a source of information. This is a man who has no education on this topic. He's only uh, you know, the only thing that gives him credentials is that he's a hateful bigot that's been platformed by the Daily Wire. Well, Ray Vanna, it it pays. I mean, grifter's got a grift. He's a con man. And wow, I mean, what a contradiction to call him and others thought leaders, Ray. I mean, we, <laughs> we need to snatch that back. We need to snatch that back. He is not a thought leader. He's a grifter. Mm -hmm. And he makes a lot of money for this grift. And I just want to know from Matt Walsh, why is he so preoccupied right. with babies and sexuality? I, I just want to know that because your point was well taken. I mean, little kindergartners, two-year-olds, you know, I got a two-year-old in my life and a four-year-old. They're not walking around, you know, talking about sexuality. They are overlaying adult thoughts about sexuality on the kids, and it makes no sense. But his preoccupation with babies and little children and sexuality is a bit creepy. Mm -hmm. Maybe he needs some therapy, right? That's what I'm going to say. He, so, he needs some therapy. Some real therapy mm -hmm. and not the kind of therapy that he advocates for. Because I don't mm -hmm. think anyone should have to endure that kind of torture. It's sick. But there's definitely something not right going on with his mind. I mean, he's made a career mm -hmm. out of talking about kids' genitalia. This is someone who I've heard on multiple occasions describe uh, uh, trans boys getting uh, mastectomies as removing the healthy breasts of teenage girls, which is a gross thing for you to be thinking of at all. I mean, those comments about wanting 16-year-olds to be having babies. You know, this is a sick, sick man, right? This is a sick, sick man that projects his sickness onto everybody else. He's got to cast the entire gay community in a negative light because he has this, these negative and, and gross thoughts. And I'll just say just to that point about putting adult ideas on children. I've, I've never seen any, you know, Drag drag shows, drag book readings for children. They're reading books that are age appropriate. They're wearing clothes that are appropriate. They're wearing oftentimes princess dresses. It's fun and it's geared towards children. But I mean, just the other uh, month, I was on a plane and the baby was turning around and, and waving at the lady behind him. And after the flight, the woman said, oh, is that your son or daughter? She goes, oh, it's my son. And she said, oh, I knew that because he was flirting with me. Ma'am, that is a baby. That is a wow. baby. I see straight. I see wow. a lot of straight people pushing these ideas of sexuality on babies and children. I don't see queer people who oftentimes just want their kids to be able to grow up to be who they want to be, to be themselves. I don't see them enforcing these same sort of weird ideas on children, and it's gross. And we got It's not cute. It's not like it's not endearing. That was just gross. It left me with a nasty taste in my mouth. Yeah, it's insanity. I mean, really, we all need some collective therapy. But seriously, Matt Walsh's preoccupation with this stuff is very telling. Mm -hmm. uh, he may have some inadequacies that he's covering up, and so he wants to make everybody else the scapegoat. But yeah, I can't believe that the baby is flirting with you. Give me a damn break, right. really. All right, let's let the baby be a baby. Let, let the, the baby be a damn baby. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. right. my grandmother used to have a saying, you got a long time to be grown and a little while to be a child. And man, I tell you, the more seasoned I become, the more that 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 wisdom of hers really means a lot. And we do live in a society where children are not allowed for various reasons to just be children. Mm -hmm. <sighs> well, that's a good note to end on. Let the children be children, because there's not a day that goes by that I wish I didn't. <laughs> I have to think about all the things I do now as an adult. Yes. And I would, it's not a day that goes by. I didn't wish I could go back to the simplicities of being a child. So um, that's all the time we have for the first hour. But everybody stick around because we'll be back with the aftermath after this break. So hold on to your butts.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.